Well, good evening, and uh, I appreciate you guys spending some of your time to come and learn about the shoulder. My name is Rob Rolf. I'm with Beacon Orthopedics and Sports Medicine, and I was going to spend maybe 20, a little bit more uh, minutes uh, talking about shoulder, and uh, then we're going to have uh, Julie from Physical Therapy talk about some exercises with the different shoulder pathologies. This talk will probably um, cater more to a rotator cuff tear as that's probably one of the more common things that we see. A little bit about myself, I'm actually from Cincinnati. I've been back practicing now for uh, 12, 13 years. I grew up on the west side, uh, went to Notre Dame, and actually did chemical engineering where uh, I worked for a few years before I came back to medical school and came back home to Cincinnati for med school. Decided to go down south to Emory for my orthopedic residency and then decided that uh, I would go to Harvard for a shoulder fellowship. I felt that uh, the shoulder joint is definitely one of the more fascinating joints. There's a lot that's happening with shoulder replacements with different types of uh, shoulder surgeries that we're doing arthroscopically. Um, and uh, with all the baby boomers that were going to slowly get older, I felt that it was a great uh, field to go into with all these changes. So hopefully I can enlighten you on why we have shoulder pain and some of the things that we can work on. And then I think at the end we'll have some time for questions. And, and even if you have questions outside of the shoulder, don't hesitate to ask. Uh, certainly there's some things that, that I can answer aside from this joint as well. So I want to talk a little bit about the shoulder anatomy. I think people always talk about the shoulder being similar to the hip and it, it's vastly different. That's one of the things that makes it unique and, and also one of the things that I think uh, makes it difficult to treat. There's a lot of things that we have to take into consideration. So we'll talk about some of the common shoulder problems and uh, treatment, both surgical and non-surgical. So the shoulder is actually uh, four major joints. You have uh, the scapula on the ribs, scapula thoracic. You have the ball and socket, we call that the glenohumeral. And then you have the sternoclavicular joint and the acromioclavicular joint. And really the two that, that have to do with motion are the glenohumeral joint and the scapulothoracic joint. And one thing that is, that is different uh, from the hip, the hip is a ball in a socket. The shoulder is really a ball on a socket. So you'll see a picture later where really it's more like a golf ball on a golf tee and, and that's why the soft tissues are so important as opposed to a hip that's that ball going into a socket. So it really is not like the hip joint and I think what makes it a fascinating joint to me. So there's a couple of different things and some of these things are, are more important when we talk about shoulder replacement but the ball is spherical. You have this ball on the top of your arm, the humerus, and that articulates with the socket. The socket is only about two-thirds the size of the ball. And that's another thing that makes it important for the soft tissues to be tensioned appropriately when we're doing surgery. So when you look at the socket head on, um, it'll look like uh, almost like a pear-shaped joint. It's got this bumper of soft tissue around it that's called the labrum, which is somewhat similar to the meniscus in the knee. It's a little different in that it has ligaments that are attached to it, and those ligaments are important if you do have a labral tear. It also, you'll see this uh, tissue at the top. This is actually part of your biceps. This is called the long head of the biceps, so this attaches to the top of the socket. And so sometimes you'll get tears up there. We call those superior labral tears, and those have to be treated surgically sometimes as well. So that bumper of cartilage deepens the groove. So if you look at this picture right here, this yellow represents the bone. The ball is going to be probably 133% bigger. So these labral, this labral tissue helps deepen the socket. It gives your shoulder some stability. So it's what we call a static stabilizer. So if it's there, it's working, it's keeping the shoulder stable along with the ligaments that are attached to it. You probably hear all your friends talk about rotator cuff tears. The rotator cuff muscles are your dynamic stabilizers. And what I mean by that is the stronger they are, the better they work with stabilizing your shoulder. You'll hear them called rotary cup muscles. I tore my rotary cup muscles. It happens all the time. They are four muscles that go around the ball to keep the ball centered in the socket. So your, your shoulder is two major joints. It's the scapula and the ribs. That's one third of the motion when you do this. And then it's the ball and socket. That's two thirds of the motion. Well, that scapula is moving. So you need to do something that when that scapula moves when you're doing your motion, it keeps that ball centered in the socket. And that's what the rotator cuff muscles do. They fire, they keep the ball centered, they act like a fulcrum and now you can lift your arm up. If you don't have a rotator cuff, you might be weak and you might have some pain when you're up here. Or I've had some people that you tear enough of your rotator cuff, you can't lift your arm up at all 
you just don't have the leverage. So your deltoid tries to lift the arm up, but you're pseudo paralytic. You try to, and it just doesn't work. So there's four muscles. There's the supraspinatus on top, the infraspinatus, and the teres minor on back, and then there's the subscapularis in the front. The top muscle, when we talk about rotator cuff tears, is the most commonly torn tendon. It is normally a tendon that tears, and that's a good thing. When you tear a tendon, tendon tissue is more like leather. So imagine I want to put a stitch in leather. That's going to be pretty good. So I can put a stitch in that leather, I can pull it back down to the bone. Muscle is like tissue paper. So if you tear the muscle, we can't really fix that. You try to put a stitch in it, it'll pull through. You try to pull a stitch in it, it'll, through, it'll pull through. So really, you usually tear your tendon, your, the rotator cuff muscles at the tendon bone junction, and that's what you want to if we want to be re- able to repair it. So this might be what a rotator cuff tear looks like to us arthroscopically. So I'm looking at your shoulder with a camera. The joint is actually in here and the rotator cuff is on top. And these are some pictures down on the right that show the rotator cuff. And then at the very right, once we put sutures in there, we've taken that tendon and pulled it back onto the bone to try to get it to heal. So the rotator cuff are dynamic stabilizers. They kind of keep that ball centered in a socket and they work with your deltoid to move your arm. So your deltoid actually lifts your arm up with the rotator cuff pulls them, keeps it centered against the socket, and gets you your leverage with uh, the shoulder. You also have a biceps muscle, and the biceps has two tendons. You have one tendon called the long head of the biceps. That comes up the front of your shoulder. It actually splits the front and the top rotator cuff and attaches to the top of the socket. And then you have a short head that actually comes up, and there's a little bony prominence here called the coracoid that hurts when you push on it, that's where the short head attaches. So those two tendons actually become two muscle bellies and then they become one tendon down here. And that biceps inserts into the radius on the thumb side of your arm. It helps with flexion of your elbow, but it also helps with supination. So if someone tears their distal biceps and they're a manual laborer, they might lose 50% of their strength when they do this with their arm, which is really important if you have to use a screwdriver or tools all day. Some people have to do that for a living, and so if you work at a desk, you may not need that biceps to be attached to where it's supposed to be. But if you are a pipe fitter, or if you're a welder, or if you're doing construction or plumbing, you might need to have that biceps reattached, or you'll lose half of the strength when you're using your hand. So in the shoulder, there's something that's important called the rotator cuff cable. And the reason this is important, because there are people that we call copers, and there are a lot of copers even at the gym today. It's usually a 70 year old gentleman who always wakes up at five o'clock in the morning to go do his workout and he is religious. He's been doing his workout five days a week for the last 40 years and he does all nine machines and then he talks to his friends and then he goes home that day. Never has any shoulder problems and he can do everything he wants and all of a sudden he comes in and pop, something happens and he can't lift his arm up anymore. And they always come into the office, they're worried about a rotator cuff tear and when I get x-rays, They have a rotator cuff tear, but it's chronic, it's massive, and I can't fix it anymore. And the reason they were able to cope is because of this rotator cuff cable. So this is a thickened tissue that when the rotator cuff muscles, the tendons come in, this thickened tissue stays intact. So if you have a tear of the top rotator cuff, you can function in life and you can still do everything. You still have enough strength on the front and top of that shoulder that when your scapula moves and you lift your arm up, it keeps that ball centered in the socket. And then finally, you tore just enough tissue of that cable that now you're pseudoparalytic and you can't lift your arm up. So this is why there are so many rotator cuff tears out there that don't need surgery. There's about 300,000 rotator cuff tears out there. We don't fix them all. We probably fix half of them. The scapula is the bone in the back. We talked about it being about one third of the motion when you move your shoulder. Um, I think a lot of people forget when we talk about therapy, there's 17 muscles attached to the scapula. So a lot of times when you're being treated for rotator cuff problems, they're also going to work on those muscles in the back of your shoulder. And those are just as important as working on the rotator cuff muscles themselves. So we're going to talk about this continuum of rotator cuff disease. And the reason I tell, tell you that it's a continuum is because it really starts with something called impingement, which leads to bursitis and tendonitis. And then that leads to partial tears and full thickness tears and massive tears and irreparable tears. That's important because anytime someone comes into the office, they're always trying to find out 
what did I do to, to hurt my shoulder? I don't know what I did. I, I can't think of the injury that I had. Most people that come in with a rotator cuff tear did not have an injury. It was a continuum of their shoulder not working the right way, of the rotator cuff starting to have tendonitis and then tendinosis and then partial tears, and then eventually they had a rotator cuff tear. Now you can have an acute injury and you had a tendon that wasn't normal get too much stress on it and, and tear your rotator cuff, but a lot of times your rotator cuff was getting beat up before you even came in after that injury. So rotator cuff tears occur more frequently as we age. That makes sense. If I took 160 year olds off the street and I said, let me get an MRI, I know you don't have any pain, half of them would have a partial thickness tear. That means some of the fibers are already torn. 28% of them would have a full thickness rotator cuff tear. And if I did the same thing at age 70, 65% of those asymptomatic people who had no shoulder problems would have a full thickness rotator cuff tear. So things that affect your rotator cuff and in, in, in the increasing the frequency of tears as you get older, kind of makes sense. We start having more wear and tear. If you smoke, high cholesterol, family history. Family history is probably one of the most important things out there, especially when you talk about shoulder arthritis. 60% of people who have shoulder replacements probably had a parent who had a shoulder replacement. Or knee arthritis, if they had a knee replacement, they probably had a parent who had a knee replacement. 40% of it's multifactorial. So these are important things when we talk about this. So rotator cuff tears, aside from being chronic, can, can, be, can occur because of different reasons. You can have the chronic degenerative tear, which we talk about, that tends to be as we age, we start seeing more frequent rotator cuff tears. You can have chronic impingement. So if your shoulder is not working the right way, the ball starts hitting up top on the acromion. And when that happens, that leads to impingement. And that impingement leads to bursitis and tendonitis. So that can weaken the tendon. You can also have an acute injury where maybe it was just too much force at one time and it pulled the tendon off of the bone. And then sometimes you get rotator cuff tears because of bad things that happened in surgery. When we first started doing shoulder replacements, we didn't really know what we were doing. So we were picking a person who had arthritis and maybe we had three different types of shoulders and we said, well, Bob, you look like two's gonna fit you more. Well, if that rotator, if that, if that shoulder replacement was too big and we overstuffed the joint, we were causing that shoulder to tear because the implant was too big. So sometimes we thought it was a complication, but really it was us causing it because we didn't know what we were doing and didn't have a fundamental understanding of doing the shoulder replacement in an anatomic manner, which is what we do now. So when you have people with asymptomatic tears, we know that over time, 50% of asymptomatic tears will get bigger. And as they start getting bigger, then you start having more clinical uh, symptoms such as pain, pain at night, difficulty with overhead activities. There was a recent study that looked at small and medium-sized tears, which means they're less than a centimeter or two, and whether you treated them non-operatively or you treated them operatively. And at one in two years, whether the patient was in a non-operative arm or an operative arm, they did exactly the same. They did very well. But when you started following these patients out to five years and you started following these patients out to 10 years, the people who didn't have it fixed, the tear progressed. And because the tear progressed, they didn't do as well as the people who had it stabilized and had that tissue reattached to their bone. So when you have these tears and you're not getting better, we want to be more aggressive about fixing them. So people will have pain that just starts on its own. They don't always have to have an activity that caused it. They'll have pain with overhead activities. And usually people will say, I have pain in my arm. And it's important because a lot of people that come into the office, they say, why'd you get x-rays on my shoulder? I told everyone in your staff that I hurt down here. It's because that pain radiates down to the arm. They can also have it in the front because they can have associated biceps pain. They can also have it in the back. But most of the time, people will localize that pain right here. People tend to have pain at night. In fact, when people start having pain at night, my, uh, my uh, test for thinking about rotator cuff goes up because usually if it's just impingement, it's activity related and then it tends to get better. You can also have acute pain uh, and weakness. Um, you can have loss of motion where you just can't lift your arm the way that you could, especially if you have a massive tear. So we describe these tears on size and there's multiple different ways to characterize it, but typically if it's a small tear, it's gonna be less than a centimeter, which is about the size of most people's thumbnails. A medium tear, maybe it's going to be two to three centimeters, and then a massive tear is going to be three to five, greater than five centimeters. So we, this is important because part of our ability to fix that rotator cuff is trying to identify what is the size of the tear. And we do this in a multiple ways. 
X-rays won't tell you there's a rotator cuff tear, but X-rays will tell you some of the radiographic findings that suggest there's a rotator cuff tear. Or they might tell you there's something else going on, like you have shoulder arthritis or you have rotator cuff arthritis. MRI is the gold standard. There are some other t tests that we have for people who might be claustrophobic or people who have implants in that we can't get an MRI, such as an arthrogram and an ultrasound. So when you look at an x-ray, and every time I look at someone's x-ray, I start to look at some things like what can cause this patient's pain. So they might have arthritis in their collarbone. They might have a big bone spur. So you, when this bone gets a little bit thicker to me, and when I see this big bone spur here, that's right over the rotator cuff. And so when I see that, I think people are at risk for potentially doing something to their rotator cuff. Sometimes people have arthritis. So here's an x-ray of arthritis. They have a big bone spur. They have a big bone spur up here. They have these cysts in the humeral head. Contrast that with a normal shoulder. That's probably not their rotator cuff. That's probably their arthritis. And so x-rays are more helpful with this patient because they don't have a normal looking x-ray. They have pain because of their arthritis. So that supraspinatus comes in. So sometimes it, with, you look at an x-ray, you might see some calcium in it. So for reasons we can't understand, when you get impingement, sometimes a body will turn on the calcium generators and you start getting calcific tendonitis. And it's a very painful uh, shoulder pathology. They come in, they can barely move their shoulder. They almost look like it's infected. They almost look like they pinched a nerve in their neck. And it's because this calcium has gotten out of that blob and caused an inflammatory response. And it's very painful. So this helps us. They have calcific tendonitis. It's not a rotator cuff tear. This is advanced arthritis. This is called rotator cuff arthritis. Notice that ball is high riding. It's not centered in the socket. That rotator cuff can't do its job of keeping the ball centered because there's no rotator cuff there anymore. So these are helpful when we get x-rays with patients. MRI is the gold standard. An MRI tells me where is the tear. If you look at this, there's, a, there's the muscle. The tendon starts getting dark and then there's a little disruption in that tendon. So there's a rotator cuff tear. It tells me, is there a partial tear, meaning some of the fibers are torn? Is there a full thickness tear? Where is it located? What is the size of the tear? Is there muscle atrophy? What that means is if there is atrophy of the muscle, this has been there for a while. And if you start getting fat in the muscle, you might have some irreversible changes that even if I try to fix it, it's not gonna work the right way. This is an MRI of a rotator cuff tear. You see the muscle coming over, you see the tendon there, and then all of a sudden, it doesn't seem like it's going all the way to the bone. So this would be probably one of the more common rotator cuff tears that we see in the office. If someone can't get an MRI, um, you can also do a CT scan where we put dye in. This was originally what we did for MRIs. We would put dye in the shoulder, and if there's a tear in the rotator cuff, it's gonna sneak out, and we'll see where it sneaks out, and we'll know there's a disruption in that rotator cuff there. Ultrasound has changed significantly how we look at these as well. So there's a lot of people that, <coughs> excuse me, are claustrophobic. A lot of people that had a procedure with an implant that doesn't allow me to get an MRI. Ultrasounds are almost as good as MRIs. They're not quite there yet. You don't go in a tube. You can be sitting there. Someone puts a probe on your shoulder and we can look at where that rotator cuff is coming over. We can look at the bursa and we can see if there's a rotator cuff tear. These are also very helpful to me if someone has a shoulder replacement in and I'm worried about them having a rotator cuff tear as well. <coughs> Excuse me. So this shows the MRI where the rotator cuff is coming over, and then this is where you see the tendon, but it doesn't seem to make its way all the way over to bone. So this is a great solution. There's quite a few people who won't come into the office because they're so deathly afraid that we're going to tell them they need an MRI, and they don't want to have that MRI, but there are other solutions we have for people that, that have that fear of getting the MRI. So when you see us in the office, we have three different goals of treatment. Number one, most people come in to see us because we hurt. you hurt. We want to control your pain. We want to optimize your function and we want to educate you about your problem, what your options are. Um, because if you don't understand what's going on, you're not going to maximize your care. So if someone's older, if they have chronic symptoms, if they're irreparable tears, those might be people that we say, we're not going to do surgery. If it's, a, if it's something that it's just impingement, if it's a small tear, we may not do surgery. But if you're a younger, active patient, you have an acute tear, you have a fixable tear, it's got to be fixable. If I can't fix it, why would I tell you to have surgery? These are all things that are important. And she'll go over some of the physical therapy things that we can do to help that shoulder before we consider surgical intervention. So this is what you might see arthroscopically. This is a rotator cuff. This is the top rotator cuff there. This is actually the ball of the humerus. There's the socket. So these are sutures that kind of do a side to side repair. We want to bring that rotator cuff closer. We want to kind of converge it. And then we put an anchor to stabilize it into the bone. So that's what we might see arthroscopically. And as a surgeon, you need to know <coughs> 
what does the tear look like? Is it something that's fixable? Is it something that needs one anchor, two anchors? How do we repair this without any tension? Um, and it's important that you go to see somebody who does quite a few of these. We also have to understand what are our goals? You know, is it someone who has low demand that they don't need to get back to, you know, a lot? Or is it someone who does triathlons? They have a lot different stress on their body than someone who works at a desk and isn't working out all the time. <coughs> Excuse me. So this might be, look, be what a rotator cuff looks like before and after. So here's the tendon, it's off the bone. This is where it was attached. So we used two rows of anchors. We were able to pull that tendon back down and that's gonna improve the patient's function. But not everybody needs surgery. This is a person that um, actually has a massive rotator cuff tear. This is a person that has a massive rotator cuff tear. Yet both people are very different. I don't know that I'm gonna have to fix this person on the right, especially if they're not having any pain but that's his shoulder. That rotator cuff is over here, it should be over here, but he has no pain, he's functional, he can do everything he wants to do. For the acromioplasty is then used to excise the distal five millimeters of clavicle and approximately Sorry two millimeters of the acromial articulation. The goal... Let me turn this off. There we go. Sorry about that. This might be what we see arthroscopically where we're trimming up those bone spurs that are pinching on the rotator cuff. This is where we might be trimming some arthritis in that collarbone. And as a physician, we need to try to identify these tear patterns for you. This tear is something that we might be able to pull down to the bone, but this tear, I'm not going to be able to take tissue that's four and a half centimeters over here and pull it back over. It's going to be under tension. It's going to fail. It's not going to do well. This tissue back here, it's a nice L shape. I just have to take this corner and get it back down to where it needs to go. And these are important as we talk to you with fixing rotator cuff tears. We wanna be able to identify the tear pattern. We'll play with the tissue, we'll pull it back down. Okay, that looks like it's pretty good. There's actually some tearing in that biceps tendon there as well. And that's what I wanna to try to reproduce when I fix the rotator cuff. This is a massive tear. This is where the rotator cuff should be attached none of it's left there so what we do is we roughen up that bone because we want to get some healing tissue so bleeding bone has growth factors once we pull that tissue down to the bleeding bone it allows that tissue to grow back into the bone with scar tissue again this is a anterior type tear i'm just pulling it over i'm trying to see okay does that where does that need to go so that i don't repair this rotator cuff under tension and this is what we're doing every single time that we fix a rotator cuff. So what's gonna help with patients and their key to success if they need to do surgical intervention? One, you wanna make sure you have good patients that have fixable tears. You wanna make sure you educate patients. We gotta be able to set goals. If, if we set expectations that we can't meet, you can have the best outcome, but if we didn't meet your expectations, you're not going to do well. I think surgical technique plays a role. We can now do this. We used to make big incisions to do this. Now we can do it all arthroscopically. It allows us to put a camera in there. I think we see things better when we do this. I think we're able to do a much better repair. We're able to do much thorough evaluation of the shoulder. We're able to treat more things that cause shoulder pain. I think as we develop new techniques, we have a lot of people that uh, maybe learned on video games. And so a lot of the younger surgeons that are coming out, they learn arthroscopically. They went from video games, they did everything arthroscopically. A lot of the older guys, they would do everything they could and if they couldn't fix it, then they would have to make their incision and they had to learn that way. So a lot of the younger physicians are able to do this arthroscopically. Now they may not know how to do it as open if they have complications, but we're able to do a lot, a lot um, more up-to-date techniques to fix this. When you have a rotator cuff repair, you tend to be in a sling for six weeks. You're doing physical therapy and that'll start anywhere from two to four weeks after surgery. At six weeks, you get a five pound limit, you get out of your sling, you're gonna be stiff. You're gonna work diligently with physical therapy. At 12 weeks, you're gonna have a 10 pound limit, you're gonna start strengthening. And most of the time by six months, you'll have no official limitations, but your rotator cuff will heal. You will heal from surgery for up to a year from surgery. And at a year, it's probably as good as you're gonna get, although some people will say you get better up to two years. 95% of people are gonna get better with pain. That's why people do this for pain relief. Despite that, some still re-tear. And interestingly, there are people all the time, I might see two or three a month, that they'll say, so-and-so fixed my rotator cuff 15 years ago, and I think I tore this one. And you go to examine them, but they're weak. It didn't heal all the way. But they don't have pain, and because they don't have pain, they're doing perfectly fine. So the number one reason you do a rotator cuff repair is for pain relief. 
You're going to have better long-term function if that tendon does scar back down to the bone, but it doesn't always mean that if the tendon retore that you're not going to be happy with the surgery that you had. We do a better job because we have new anchors that absorb into the bone, they turn into bone. We have smaller anchors, we have smaller devices that can pierce the tendon with less traumatic uh, effect. When they first started doing this, the tendon would look like Swiss cheese. They put these big metal anchors and if they failed, you had no bone left. Now when you have bone resorbing anchors, if you have a failure, you go in, you have a fresh canvas to work with. These sutures are much smaller, they're much stronger. We used to put sutures in that would dissolve. Well, if your rotator cuff didn't heal before that suture dissolved, it didn't stay down to bone. Now we put non-absorbable sutures, that rotator cuff heals, and now the sutures act more like a rebar, rebar. So they probably keep you stronger a lot longer. There are irreparable tears, and we looked at that on x-ray. If your humeral head has a lot of arthritis and it's not down where it should be, it's not worth having surgery. There are different arthroplasty options for those patients. And that might be something that you have an irreparable rotator cuff tear. This is a shoulder replacement. This is actually called a reverse shoulder. And the reason it's called a reverse shoulder is because you have the ball on the socket and the socket on the ball. So we talked about the fact that your deltoid lifts your arm up. Well, if your rotator cuff is not going to be doing a good job, you stay down here. Well, if you switch the anatomy, this ball makes up for not having a rotator cuff. So now your deltoid lifts your arm up, but the socket engages and does exactly what the rotator cuff was doing. So that would be the, the surgical treatment for someone who has an irreparable rotator cuff tear. That's a lot of stuff in 30 minutes. Are there any questions for me before I switch over to physical therapy? So frozen shoulder, interestingly, is the number one Google thing about shoulder. So frozen shoulder is where your ligaments get really tight and inflamed. And so it's not the most common thing we see in the office, but it's the most common Google thing. And so when your, shoulder, when your ligaments get really tight and inflamed, you lose your motion. And there's three different phases. Phase one, you start hurting and you lose motion. So women will say, I can't do my hair. I can't do my bra. Guys will say, I can't do my billfold. Phase two, pain is better but you're still stiff. And phase three is resolution of your motion. The problem with frozen shoulder is that each phase can take six months to a year and a half. If you did nothing, your problem could take a year and a half to four and a half years to get better. So when we see you in the, in the, in the OR or in the clinic, we try non-operative management. We might try steroid injection. We want to do general physical therapy. This is the one time where I tell the patients, if your physical therapist rips out your rubber bands and you're working on strengthening, they don't know what frozen shoulder is. It is gentle range of motion with the guidance of physical therapy and we're not trying to get everything back right away it's almost like groundhog's day you feel like you get better and you take a step back and you feel like you get better and you take a step back but we want to get you better over two to three months not two to three weeks and so i that's one that i ask people to be patient with and then if we can't get the pain under control or if we can't get your range of motion back after six nine plus months then we can treat it surgically where we basically go in there and we release the capsule and start aggressive range of motion so that you get your range of motion back. That's a good question. Thank you. Is pain, is pain your only indication to make an appointment with you? Is pain the only indication? I, I mean, I see people for maybe they lose their function, maybe they're having difficulty with overhead activity, maybe they're having night pain, maybe they, just can't, they don't feel like they can do the things they used to be able to do with their shoulder. I mean, we're happy to see people for anything with respect to the shoulder. Were there any particular symptoms you were curious about? No, no, just in case. Yeah. What, what would be the alarm that would go off? Say? Pain is probably the number one. It's usually the, the number one, two reasons that people come in, one, dysfunction. Uh, that's probably number two on, this, on the scale, but number one is pain. They're, they can't sleep. They're irritable. Once, you, once you're not sleeping and irritable, you're not fun at home. You know you're snapping at people. You're snapping at work. It's just that's when people tend to come in. I got a cortisone shot two years ago. Uh-huh. Why did he give you that shot? So cortisone shots are basically a, a local anti-inflammatory. So it's like taking ibuprofen and putting it in there. So we'll do a steroid shot with certain shoulder injuries to try to calm down the inflammation. That steroid shot doesn't last two years, but I've had people that certainly have had relief for two years. What it basically does is it causes that calms down the inflammation, allows you to do your physical therapy. Once you do your physical therapy and you get your shoulder working better, that's going to be what a long that's going to be more of a long-lasting effect for you. 
but steroid shots are very common with shoulder pathology. I had what they call a massive rotator cuff uh -huh. tear, and uh, it was it was fixed, and uh, I was still having pain. I just presume maybe my other shoulder was also torn. Sure. And he said I'm bone on bone, and the only thing that will fix that is a shoulder replacement. Correct. That is correct. Yeah. If 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 that's what he thinks the source of your pain is, I mean there are different ways to tease that out, but I mean that would be an appropriate treatment, not knowing the particulars. Mm -hmm. It's not going to happen. Shoulder replacements are actually easier to recover from than rotator cuff tears. Really? If you grew, so my two major patients are replacements, that's anatomic and reverse, and rotator cuff repairs. If you group them, in general, rotator cuff repairs hurt longer. They just, they, they're a bear to deal with. Shoulder replacement, happiest patients I have. That does not mean that some of these don't hurt and some of these are easy, but on general, it's not as bad as having a rotator cuff repair. Did you have a question, sir? Me? No. Okay. So I've had some friends who've got shoulder replacements. Uh -huh. Is there a life after shoulder replacements? Absolutely. So shoulder replacements where you replace the joint either with a reverse or with, an, with a ball and socket that looks anatomic. Um, I let people do most things. You know, the only thing that people will complain about is every once in a while you might have some weakness if you do a, if you do a bow, if you bow hunt. You might have a little bit of weakness with that and you have to go to a crossbow. Um, but they golf, they swim. The only thing I don't, I don't let them, I tell them not to do is heavy lifting. So if you have a shoulder replacement, you know, some people will say do whatever you feel comfortable, but really I think you shouldn't lift more than 50 pounds overhead. You can pull more, you can lift down here, but you're loading your joint when you're up here. And if you do, if you look at the literature, if you did a hundred of them shoulder replacements today, in 10 years, uh, 90 plus would be doing well. So the longest study is Mayo Clinic at 15 years, 88% of the people were still doing very well. And that was average age of 50 years of age that had their shoulder replaced. So you're very functional after a shoulder replacement. Did you have one more question? Yeah, um, I'm thinking of exercise. Um, leg extensions are good for strength in the knee and alignment. Mm -hmm. Is there types of exercise that are good for the shoulder? Yeah, I think she's going to talk about some of those exercises that might be good. So the, the biggest things are strengthening the muscles of the rotator cuff, the muscles around the scapula, and also keeping your shoulder loose. A lot of people have, she'll talk about this, but have tightness in the back of the shoulder. So if you're tight in the back of the shoulder, you can't clear that acromion and it'll cause an impingement. So they're always working on working on your stretching in the posterior capsule as well as the strengthening. But that's a good segue into her talk, I think. So my name is Julie Lawler. I'm a uh, physical therapist with TriHealth Orthopedics. And today I'm going to give you more of the, the preventative and rehab of the, uh, of the shoulder. I, again, am also talking about the rotator cuff, mainly because that is what I see uh, when patients come into the clinic and they have shoulder pain. My hope, though, today is that, if nothing else, you learn some tips and tricks of how to maintain a healthy shoulder and what to do when there's pain. So objectives. Um, to hear some of the role of the rotator cuff in daily tasks, to hear some of the clinical complaints that rotator cuff injuries um, are, I'm hearing as a physical therapist, and then what your expectations in physical therapy would be, to learn some exercises to strengthen and stretch the shoulder for both pain relief and, and maintenance, to really understand the importance of the additional support system of the scapular stabilizers or shoulder blade muscles that Dr. Roth has already touched on a little bit, and also how important posture is to understand how to prevent shoulder injury and maintain a healthy shoulder complex overall, and then what to do if you start to experience shoulder pain. So just a few, few facts and figures and a little bit of a run through of the anatomy. Um, one study shows that between 18 to 26 percent of the adult population will experience shoulder pain at some point in their lifetime. So we're talking about a quarter of adults, which is a pretty prevalent population. Uh, studies suggest that after age 50, there are degenerative changes that have occurred throughout rotator cuff tendons, um, talking about a little bit less blood supply, uh, weaker tissue quality, which all makes us more susceptible to having rotator cuff issues. Um, like I mentioned, the rotator cuff injury is the most common diagnosis of shoulder pain, which not only do I see clinically, but studies have backed this up. And the uh, rotator cuff injuries that I most likely see is a result of the, the wear and tear um, as opposed to something um, specifically happening. However, we do see that quite often, especially in the wintertime. Um, if patients fall on ice or they have a skiing accident and their arm is outstretched. But more likely than not, I'm seeing it from more of a wear and tear type overuse injury. 
So just briefly, um, what's the rotator cuff and what does it do? Again, it's the grouping of the four small muscles that encapsulate the, the ball on the socket joint um, of the shoulder. They uh, are four very small muscles that do a big job and they have to work together to really rotate the arm and lift the arm overhead, outside of base of support. And that's when it's really, um, really activated. They play a dual role of being both stabilizers and movers of the shoulder. There's a few things that it relies on. Um, one in particular is the uh, is a bursa, which is the fluid-filled sac. And as you can see in this picture, um, it, it kind of protects the uh, the tendons and where they're attaching from bony prominences. Uh, unfortunately, again, with, with age, uh, we lose some of our lubrication of that bursa. There's sometimes a little bit more friction on the uh, rotator cuff tendons and can, again, predispose us to having some rotator cuff issues. Uh, commonly, I see the diagnosis of a rotator cuff tendinop tendinopathy or tendinitis um, alongside uh, typically a shoulder impingement. So sometimes they, uh, a patient will come in, the rotator cuff's involved, but also the, the shoulder's just not moving as well as it should. So we should have a nice kind of like slide and glide motion of our shoulder taking place, but with an impingement, we're just not getting the full mobility. And we need full mobility to have the rotator cuff being as effective as it should be. Uh, also, I want to be also for it to be said is the further the arm is away from the body, the more stress and strain that get, get, gets put on the rotator cuff, um, even more so if you're holding weighted object. So clinical complaints. Um, typically, when a patient comes in, the rotator cuff's invo involved. It's because there's some kind of overuse or repetitive motion. So patients will tell me things that are difficult are like putting on or taking off a shirt and jacket, uh, sleeping on that shoulder. Reaching behind your back, whether it be doing your hair up here or reaching back behind you like you're putting on a belt. Reaching over shoulder height like you're going into a cabinet. Uh, or reaching out to the side like you're picking up a bag in the passenger seats. And us <coughs> ladies with big purses and they tend to be heavy, we do this quite often. And so we end up having a little bit of a aggravation and irritation in the shoulder. And also lifting weighted objects above waist level like you're putting something in or out of the refrigerator like a, a gallon of milk. So sometimes patients will say, well, I'm not sure what I did. And again, it could be a long-term or short-term use. So you could be years of manual or heavy labor, labor worker. Um, you could have started a new exercise routine or you used the same exercise routine and maybe you added some weights or repetition, something enough to start to aggravate this rotator cuff. Uh, I see this a lot in overhead recreational athletes. So tennis, doing like a serving motion. I'm seeing a lot more patients playing pickleball these days. Uh, softball or baseball if you make doing a throwing motion, um, swimming and again coming up over your head and or it could be something as simple as you just did a weekend of yard work and again it was something that was underlying and it was just something that changed in your in your daily routine and it was enough to set off symptoms. So like I said I'm, I'm mainly focusing on the rotator cuff but there's a few other shoulder injuries that I do tend to see. Uh, the labrum is one, so again, it's a rim of cartilage that is lining the, the shoulder and deepens the socket. It works to reinforce the stability of the shoulder and serves as a, as a nice attachment point for, again, ligaments and namely the biceps tendon. The tears can occur from a few things. Um, if you have somebody that is a, um, like a chronic or acute like subluxer or dislocator, maybe the, the arm's just not staying in the socket like it should, that'll put more, more pressure and uh, pain into the labrum. I see this a lot in uh, patients that will do a lot of like heavy lifting or weight training or if they're throwers. And again, I see this a lot in baseball. So patients tend to have complaints of limited motion and function. And a lot of the time the pain is located in front of the shoulders, kind of near the biceps, which again makes it a little bit difficult if, we're, if they're coming in the office because that's a, a, another place where we'll tend to have a, like bicep tendonitis start to be aggravating and where we're, we'll have pain in the same location. So with biceps tendonitis, um, again, the biceps muscle is comprised of two tendon attachments at the shoulder. One, again, attaching into the labrum. Uh, with age, again, the tendon becomes stiffer and more prone to arthritis or bone spurs, and it sits in this groove, so again, could aggravate the, the tendon a little bit more. Uh, again, repetitive overhead activity can predispose the tendon or to inflammation and pain. And the symptoms um, include pain with reaching overhead or completing a rotation movement with your forearm. So opening a lid or again using like a screwdriver. Um, and again, like I said, it tends to be in the front of the shoulder as well. 
So expectations in PT um, would definitely be focused on flexibility and strength. So if you're sent to therapy for rotator cuff issues, um, for one, if, if you're not having the full range of motion, we need to establish that as, as early as possible. And that could mean from us doing some what we call joint mobilizations to try to reestablish the mechanics and the movement pattern of the shoulder. And then I would have you follow up with a home exercise program working on the flexibility and stretching, which we'll get to here on the next slide. But we need to have full range of motion for the rotator cuff to be fully effective and not have an inflammatory effect. As far as strength goes, um, that's also something that we would focus on in physical therapy. To have the rotator cuff at its full capacity, we need it to be as strong as possible and to, uh, to limit that pain onset. So overall, the shoulder needs to have full range of motion and strength from the rotator cuff to limit that overuse that we tend to do and cause that wear and tear uh, that we tend to see in the rotator cuff over time. So as far as shoulder stretches go, um, these are a few that I, I like to give, especially initially. Um, the first one is what we call a wall slide or wall walk. And so again, sometimes this, what we call this capsule back here tends to be a little bit tight. It'll limit our motion coming up overhead or reaching behind our back or even coming across our body here. So sometimes when patients don't have the full range of motion coming up like this, the wall provides a little bit of a support system to help glide up a little bit more to start working on a little bit more range of motion. I tend to tell patients to try this maybe in the shower or right after when the muscles are a little bit warm. We can kind of trick the muscles to going a little bit further. The next uh, exercise is stretch behind the back. Um, this is again where I'll have patients tell me, you know, they just, men for instance, they can't grab their wallet or put their belt on. Women they can't uh, put on or off their bra. So this is at least starts to work into the functional range of motion and rotation behind your back. As far as the um, really focusing on what we call this capsule stretch back here, um, the top one I like better where we have our shoulder in like a 90 degree angle, the elbows at a 90 degree angle, and we're lying on that side that's a little bit more painful, and then using our good arm to just gently push down until we feel a stretch, never into pain, but just to the edge of it, is what I'll typically tell patients. Sometimes patients don't like to lie on that side or they're having difficulty because of pain, and that's why I would give them the stretch underneath that one where you're just coming straight across your body and again, trying to feel a stretch back here in this capsule like you're trying to do in the, in the top picture. With the stretches, um, I'm, I'm looking more for longer holds and less repetition. So, you know, with the wall slides or the stretch behind your back, you know, I would say you could do about 10 of them, hold for anywhere between 5 to 10 seconds if it's tolerable. But the other two, I'm looking more for a 20 to 30 second hold three to five times. And I like to start doing this a couple times a day. For rotator cuff strengthening, um, I have two slides for this. So the first one, kind of lying on your side, um, going against gravity, and so you know sometimes gravity is enough to just start to activate the rotator cuff. Sometimes if um, a patient has a little bit of strength going, uh, they say you can you, know, you can use a little bit of a, a small weight, one to two pounds to start. Um, the second exercise, you're using more of a resistance band to start to activate the shoulder blades with the with the rotator cuff and putting yourself in a little bit of a better posture, which again, we'll, we'll start to talk about here in a minute. And then the third exercise is another one I like to do. I like to do this more along a wall because again, we're getting a little bit more support, but isometrically starting to engage the rotator cuff by putting out in a resistance loop and coming up the wall straight up here or to start to do what we call like a wall walk. So again, if we can engage the rotator cuff with the shoulder blade muscles, especially maintaining it up overhead, we're um, starting to make a better connection for the rotator cuff. So with both of these, or all three of these exercises, I would say to aim for like two sets of 10, maybe up to three sets of 10, or increasing resistance or weight, depending on how you're progressing through. Another set of three exercises that I like are resisted external rotation. Again, she's using a resistance band. Um, so you're rotating out. Um, the next one, you're resisted rotating in and then also doing a motion that we call scaption, where we're not quite out to the side, we're not quite in front, but we're kind of squeezing back and reaching up in this motion. Again, we don't have to add weights, but we can if it starts to be too easy against gravity, but it starts to activate the rotator cuff as well in that position. And again, I would say two sets of 10 is where I would start. So the support system, um, I can't teach my patients enough about good posture and shoulder blade activation. Because like Dr. Rolf said, I mean, this is almost as important as strengthening the rotator cuff. So 
Rotator cuff for small muscles doing a big job. We need help to control and stabilize the shoulder doing a repetitive reaching and movement tasks. So what I, what I typically tell patients, you know, with good posture, you're allowing your shoulder to be in a, an optimal position for better body mechanics and to allow the shoulder to move as well as it should. So my example is, and I'll turn this way. So we tend to be on our phones and computers a lot. So our posture tends to go a little bit more forward. Okay. So if I'm in this position and I go to reach my arm up, this is as far as I can go and I'm straining and doesn't feel great. If I bring my shoulder blades back and I'm in a good posture and I reach up, then I have full range of motion, no pain and not straining at all. So this is again, a good thing to think about if you're constantly on phones or computers to start thinking about a better posture to allow your shoulder to move as optimally as possible. Going along with that, the scapular stabilizers or shoulder blade muscles that we think of. Um, again, a lot of small little muscles, but they're controlling and providing this base of support to help the rotator cuff for as much as we tend to use it. Um, you know, we, we're working on these, these small little muscles to really, to really focus on um, as much as we tend to overuse the arm to provide this nice stable support system. So I have a lot of patients that will come in and they say, hey, you know, I, I'm, I'm really active with my lifting, I'm doing great, but why am I having the shoulder pain? And I'll ask them, well, you know, what kind of exercises do you do? And they're typically telling me, well, you know, I like to do some chest presses and some incline presses and some pec flies, you know, biceps and triceps. And that's all well and good, but what they're doing is a lot of pushing motion and not so much pulling motion. And so they're basically neglecting all of these shoulder blade muscles back here because their focus are all on the muscles in the front. So again, we're playing into more of that kind of posture position that we're trying to avoid. So we start to talk about, you know, just activating these shoulder blade muscles a little bit more and I'll humble them a little bit and put them on their stomach and I can use just one finger and they can't even hold their arm up against my weight. And so it kind of, you know, pulls the point in that, you know, we really need to work a little bit more on the shoulder blade muscles. I mean, if you, you know, work your quadriceps, you work your, hand, your hamstrings. If you work your biceps, we tend to work our triceps. And it's the same concept here where we want to start to engage a little bit more of these smaller shoulder blade muscles. So some of the exercises, again, I'll start with, and there's um, quite a few that we can go through. But with these four, no matter what you do, you always want to activate and squeeze the shoulder blade muscles first before you do any of these arm movements. So if you're lying on your side, you know, squeezing your shoulder blade first and then coming up in this semi-circle motion to start to activate a little bit more of the kind of the upward and downward rotators here of the shoulder blade. Then putting you on your stomach if you can tolerate it. Otherwise, if that's not comfortable to just kind of leaning over a, a bench or a table to start doing any of these three exercises. The first one being a row coming straight back. Um, the next one, arm straight coming straight back and then also squeezing the shoulder blade and coming out to the side. Again, with all of these, gravity sometimes is enough. Um, I will sometimes add, you know, small weights depending on how they're progressing through, but the main thing is I want them to start activating the shoulder blades a little bit more. Compensatory patterns I tend to see as we start to get a little bit more, um, if you start to fatigue is when I start to see people start to engage their upper trap muscles and now suddenly you're feeling like you know, neck tension and that's what again we want to avoid. <clears throat> so again always squeezing the shoulder blades back before you start doing any of these exercises. Typically I would say you know you can either do your two sets of 10 or you can do um, like 10 times and hold for about five seconds to make it a little bit more difficult. So tips for maintaining shoulder health. I know this is easier said than done, but try to limit your repetition and overuse. Um, you want to decrease lifting weighted objects overhead and outside your base of support. Um, instead, opt for picking up things closer to your body. So I tell you know, people, if your grandparents or your parents, if you're trying to lift up a small child or even grocery bags, you want to be close to your body here to lift up as opposed to it being further away from your base of support. Just to give your rotator cuff a little bit more health. Um, you can sleep on your, I like patients that typically sleep on their side, they can even put a pillow under their arm just for a little bit of comfort. I try to tell patients try to avoid sleeping in a position on your stomach where your arm's up overhead because that could be there for hours and cause a little bit of discomfort over time. Um, again, I want you to incorporate more shoulder blade strengthening, so again, more of the pulling motion into your workout program. Um, think good posture, good posture, good posture. And try not to wait too long before seeking out a specialist. Um, you try not to avoid losing your range of motion because if that starts to happen where we're engaging with that, you know, impingement and we're going down this slippery slope or even, you know, going down to where the frozen shoulder may start, you know, it's a longer road to recovery. 
So what to do if you start to experience shoulder pain? Um, first thing is try to modify your activity. Uh, limit your heavy lifting um, or reaching above shoulder level. Um, you know, again, you can even look at like if you're, you know, at work in your ergonomic setup. Are you always reaching for a phone or a stapler or something that's outside your base of support? Try to bring things a little bit closer in. To try to avoid that. Like I mentioned, women with purses, we're either reaching behind our, you know, behind us, or outside, you know, to our uh, passenger seat. So either getting out and, and picking it up manually, just trying to avoid that constant motion outside our base. You could try doing some icing um, to limit the pain relief or inflammation. Um, I would recommend 10 to 15 minutes, one to two times a day. I think it's more effective after activity. So if you've done, you know, a day of yard work, um, when, you've, when you've completed that task, I would say come in and that's when I would suggest icing. Try to avoid sleeping on the shoulder that hurts. Um, a lot of patients will opt for a recliner. Uh, it just puts them in a, a more supportive position and limits the chance of them turning over on the painful shoulder. Try to maintain the flexibility and motion of the shoulder, like some of the stretches I, I showed you today. You could have tried to see if you can regain some of it, or at least if nothing else, try not to lose any more that, that you may already have lost. Um, again, like I mentioned, stretching in the shower or shortly after will sometimes uh, make it a little bit more tolerable to complete. Um, if it gets to the point, your doctor may prescribe pain medication or anti-inflammatories. Um, he also talked a little bit about a steroid, steroid injection. I do see a lot of patients that will come shortly after it. It makes PT a little bit more tolerable. <clears throat> um, but honestly, if it's been, you know, a couple of weeks, you've tried some of your exercises, um, you're, you're having pain, it's either not getting better or it's limiting your function or, in fact, the pain is getting worse, that's what I would say. Definitely follow up with your ortho doctor you know, and your physical therapist to see if you can design a plan of care that's specifically for you. So I know um, if you want more information or appointments, um, here at this clinic, I put the number on there. Um, I actually am, uh, work up in Westchester on the Liberty Way location. Um, I put my number on there as well in case you leave here today and you have a couple questions and you um, want to give me a call and, and we can talk about it later. Um, I put some pictures on here because if you're sitting there thinking, wow, I really overuse my shoulder quite often, I just want to let you know that you're not alone. I have two little ones at home and I am constantly lifting, carrying, wrestling with them um, at all times. So I am constantly putting my, uh, my rotator cuff to use. And then my two fur balls on the right, um, I am constantly straining my rotator cuff walking them because they have yet to meet a squirrel that they won't chase. Um, so, you know, daily life just puts a lot of stress on our shoulder, but, you know, there's ways to uh, recover from that. Uh, thank you for listening to the talk, and again, if you have any questions, uh, please feel free to reach out.